I'm trying to recreate something that, you know, uh, we already do it. Right, and that's what I've been talking to everybody about in, those, in these workshops. Uh, Dr. Ekarike is the consistency of assessment. Like it, we can't wait for middle states. And that way, if it's already done and we do it on a consistent basis, when things like middle states right. happens, we already have those things at our disposal. Uh, and so that's, that's one right. of the things I've been I've been sort of reiterating over and over again, probably to the degree that people are tired of hearing about it. And also talking about the need that even though teachers teach differently, um, interdepartmentally, and even if it is not a core course, we've got to assess, establish consistent common assessments so that we can see where our students are and know how we help them in their areas of weakness. And so one thing that I've not been seeing is like across the board, there's no common rubrics in most places. I'm sure somebody has them, but in most places, there's no common rubric. There is no common assessment across department or across classes. And those things are more hurtful than helpful because what happens is, is if we have university strategic goals, then we need to make sure that we're in alignment with those strategic goals, which means that, that there needs to be commonality of assessment across the board. Right, maybe something we may need to look at or think about. Um, some people, some people have difficulties trying to understand that assessment is not different from benchmarks. What I'm saying? If we may look at the language that we're using and see if that might help them. Because when we talk about assessment, I'm, I'm listening to some departments. They're telling me, they say, oh, you know, we don't know much about assessment. I, we know that it's the education department that does assessment all the time. I said, no, 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 no. Everybody does assessment. You know, some of them use the term benchmark. You know, when a student meets certain criteria, meet that benchmark, we move forward. But here, it's not different from assessment. There's something for you to think about and see if that language might help you. See there? Hello. Hello. Okay, I'm here. I'm here, Dr. Enrique. I was trying to put my video camera back on because it said stop the video and I want to restart. So, but Dr. Dr. Enrique, I think we're gonna have to table this discussion for later. I'm going to go ahead and get okay. started because we've given everybody almost 15 minutes to uh, join in. So I want to kind of go ahead and get started. Um, since we have you and Dr. Smith, I think it's a good place to start. Uh, and what I want to start off with, I want to start by giving you guys an assessment. And if people kind of chime in later, um, they can see the code on the um, code on the screen to take it. So I want to put it up on the screen for you now. So do me a favor, put this, um, put joinmyquiz.com in your browser. And when it pops up, you know, put in this code that you see on the, on the screen. You know, just keep going because I, I am going to be on the computer in a few minutes. So I'll be able to switch. Uh, let me get to my... On my quiz .com. All right, that's in. Put the code in. So hit join. Yes, sir. All right. So I'm there. Put my name in. Mm hmm You can put your name in. So we can see what a high score you'll have, Dr. Smith. Okay. Hmm. 
Okay. And Dr. Ekarike, how long would it be before you're at an actual computer? Because you could also- no, I want to be the only one today. This way I'm the only one with the high score. <laughs> well, you're my star. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, share, I'll share a score with you, Dr. Smith. <laughs> I'll share a score with you, Dr. Smith. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And what I'll do is I'll just use Dr. Smith as our template. There we go. I'll be the standard. Great. It's about two more minutes. this up here because I want you guys to see something. Um, the reason why I gave you this first is because a lot of times when you talk about um, classroom assessment, because keep in mind, we're not talking about uh, faculty assessment plans or departmental assessment plans right now. We're talking about actual assessments that are given in the course 
through the professors. So what happens is a lot of times when you talk about um, giving more assessments and consistency of assessments, a lot of educators get overwhelmed because they think uh, that means more papers to grade, that means more work for the students and they barely do what I'm giving them now. But what happens is, is when you see platforms like this, which is free, quiz is, there are other platforms like Kahoot, uh, My Study Buddy, and I plan on giving you guys some of those free platforms. It does not only the assessment, but the work for you, right? Even down to, let's say for instance, um, let's say Dr. Smith is teaching a class and he knows that he has some people that, that struggle with integrity. You can randomize the order of the questions so that even though students are taking the same assessment, they're taking the question, they're taking the assessment in a different order. And he can do that per class, per student, whatever he feels comfortable with. Now, when it comes to the data in that assessment, this a platform such as this makes the data collection even easier. If you see at the top of the screen, there are four quadrants. In the first quadrant, it tells you what the class accuracy is, right? So what that tells you is how, you, how your students performed on a particular assessment, right? Which is important because let's say for instance, this is uh, Dr. Peter's class and she finds that 60% uh, of her students have failed this particular exam. Well, whatever this this assessment is, Dr. Peters knows that if 60% of the students uh, fail this particular assessment, then there's some areas of deficiency or weakness that she needs to go back and review with the students, right? And she may even use this because it's a good place to do formative assessments. And formative assessments is when we do those periodic reviews with our students to see if they've comprehended what we've taught at each step of the way. Like I might give uh, an, a formative assessment in the middle of chapter one to make sure what the students understand what we're covering. And if my students don't do so well, then I know that as I continue to teach periodically, I've got to set aside some time to go back and review the information or the area that they had difficulty in. The second quadrant that you see is called the toughest question. This lets you know that this is the area or this is the question where your students, uh, where most students failed, right? So that means that, that, it get, that gives you a very specific place to look when it is you're doing your review and you're assessing what your students do or don't understand. When we get to the longest question, this means this is the particular area that your students spent the most amount of time. And we know whenever our students spend a long time on something, it is usually because they are processing or maybe this particular concept that we've taught was difficult for them to understand. So they have to spend a little bit more time than they would on the other questions. And again, that gives us area within our course to work on retention because what we're doing is we're seeing where there is a need and how we can specifically meet the needs of our students. And so this is why, you know, platforms such as this are very, very helpful when we conduct assessments because it helps us not only with uh, not having the grade, what the, the assessments that we give our students, but it helps us with the collection of data. Because you will see here, it even shows you where specifically your students struggle. So I know that for Greg, he, he did well on questions seven and eight, but with the rest of the questions, he had some difficulty. So I might give Greg some additional credit or some options to uh, do a retake of the test or either resubmit some work where he had some difficulty. And so this not only helps Greg, but it helps me to make sure that I'm going back and recovering those areas where I see that Greg was struggling. Okay, so now I wanna share with you the actual, I wanna share with you an actual, um, assessment overview to talk about the different types of assessment, what they mean and why we need to use them, what they mean and why we need to use them. I think this is extremely important for all of us. So I'm about to put that on the screen for you. Give me one second.
Okay. So I skipped ahead. I moved beyond the title and skipped ahead so we can go ahead and get started because we're already really, really behind. So what happens is, is that us engaging on uh, this assessment journey is nothing new, right? And it is not something that is only akin to Cheney University. Um, when we talk about this, this um, sort of push toward assessments and this, uh, we keep hearing about assessments in all these meetings, even when we talk about uh, middle states and we talk about other, other bodies of accreditation and we talk about community partners, we keep hearing about assessment, assessment, assessment. Well, the reason why we are hearing about these things is because now what is starting to happen is that they're starting to be more accountability in the learning process. So you're telling me, so what, what, what our stakeholders and what our accreditation people are saying, you're not telling me that these students are doing this well. Well, how are you tracking them? How do we know that they're really growing, right? And if you're telling me that students are struggling and they're failing, how are you addressing these issues, right? So this is part of that whole accountability and education that we're starting to see. Because for so long, you know, um, universities were accused of either being too hard or just passing students along. And so now, when we talk about the Department of Education and the accrediting bodies, they want to see that there's some sort of accountability across the board. And what are we doing to address not only the weaknesses of our students, but what are we doing in order to, to improve the areas of strength? And so when we put these strategic goals up on our website, the way that we have conducted our assessment, it illustrates how well we have, uh, how well we've executed what we said we plan on doing in our strategic goals. Um, anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, these are the four major types of assessment, right? Uh, there's diagnostic assessment. Let me tell you why this is important and what it really is. Uh, assessment is just really another word for a test and quiz, but it's extremely important. So a diagnostic assessment is basically a quiz test exam that we give as soon as school starts as a means to see where our students are. Right. It is a means to see where our students are. You know, we hear the root word in diagnostic, which is diagnosis. So what happens is, is that when we do diagnostic assessments, it allows us to see how we can help our students and how we can improve upon what they already know. A good example of this is, let's say that we have an English department, right? Before the semester ever starts, the English department needs to meet when they have their uh, professional development before the semester starts, they need to make sure that they have sat down and created and agreed upon a diagnostic exam to give their core students. Because what happens is it, it could either be a reading comprehension exam or an essay examination. Whatever it is, there also needs to be a common rubric that is created, right? Because we need to make sure that everybody who's giving this exam and everybody who's teaching this particular course is judging based on the same standards and student learning outcomes. Because what happens when we don't do that, when we don't have a uniformity in grading, we end up seeing that problems trickle up because the A and, doc, the a and Dr. Smith's class might be a C in my class because I have a completely different standard of grading. Doesn't mean that Dr. Smith is less of a teacher than me. It just means that because we have not sat down as a program, as a department, or as instructors who are teaching the same course, because we have not sat down to agree upon the standards and student learning outcomes, we're sort of putting our students at a deficit. So we want to make sure that we're using the same standards because this is how we're able to help them. So let's say, for instance, when we give this uh, a reading comprehension exam and we see that I'm just making up numbers because I don't know. So let's say, for instance, we see that 37 percent of our students are reading um, at or above grade level. Then we see 40 percent who are reading. Um, 
at or below grade level. The other 20% are exemplary readers. Well, we know the, 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 the people that need our focus are the people that are reading below grade level. Now, because we figured that out when we gave the diagnostic exam, now we can either partner we can partner with the Academic Success Center. We can partner with Mr. Ghana and create workshops, programs, institutes, whatever you want to call it, that outside of our classroom help our students get to pre uh, get prepared to perform better in our classrooms. We can also make sure that um, I like to do a thing called entrance and exit. And I learned about this when I was teaching high school, entrance and exit. Entrance, uh, entrance is during the first five minutes of class, the su students will get um, a little quizzes or a Kahoot, a quick assessment that gives a review of what happened the week before or the day before, whatever it was, if, especially if it was a, a major assignment that we're covering or a major chapter that we're reading. I'll give a quick five minute entrance. And then the last five or 10 minutes, I may have them write an exit, a exit ticket, which basically is for five minutes, they're writing about what it is they learned or the main idea of what they read and explaining it in paragraph form. Not only is that improving their overall classroom performance because they have to do it consistently, but it gives me a way to gauge what they do or don't know and understand how it is that I can help them. That's what a diagnostic assessment does. And that's what a formative assessment does. Formatives are given on a more consistent basis. Um, I found out that Dr. Spears has been giving formative assessments throughout her class, which made my heart leap. And she didn't know what it was called, but she gives uh, sort of an assessment every class period or every other class period, just to make sure that her students are comprehending what it is that she's teaching. Well, what is wonderful about this is that it doesn't have to be anything long and drawn out. It could be five, 10 questions that you've already programmed into one uh, to, to, to the app that I showed you about or some other app that you know about. And what that does is that gives you the opportunity to see at each step of the way, are students really retaining the information that you've been sharing with them within the context of class? Because we know that one of the biggest issues we see time and time again is the retaining of the information. Students may be able to regurgitate something they heard, but the comprehension is something altogether different. So we want to make sure that we're assessing them. And it doesn't always have to be something formal, doesn't have to be long and drawn out. And I definitely want you to stay away from paper assessments. Use, don't make the, don't make this more complicated for yourself. Use some sort of app or some program that does the grading for you, because usually when you use those sort of programs, they also do the data for you, because the data is an extremely important piece. Because one of the things, uh, let me say two of the things that we keep hearing at Cheney over and over again are retention and efficacy, right? Retention and efficacy. Are we doing what's necessary to retain our students? And is what we're doing efficient? Can it be maintained? Is it sustainable, right? Well, the only way we're gonna be able to see that is not only by giving assessments, but by analyzing the data that we get from these assessments. And that doesn't have to be anything long or drawn out. That could be after you have collected the information, you do a little write up saying uh, about how students are really struggling in the area of quadrat quadratic angles. I've reached out to Mr. Ghana to see if the science tutors can uh, review quadratic angles and, uh, and this other thing that they didn't understand. So it's really, really simplistic, but the issue is we've got to be consistent in what we do. We've got to be consistent and uniform. So I, I mentioned this because the other day somebody asked me a good question. They said, well, Dr. Hogg, I got two questions. What if I'm teaching a class that is not a core class? What if I'm teaching a class and it's just this one class the students take in their major and I'm the only one that's teaching a class? I said, that's, that's a really good question. I say, even in that case, you need to make sure that you're giving assessments on a consistent basis. Why? Because if this is a course for majors, 
then even when they come to your course, if this is the one course that they have to take as a major, you're going to be assuming that there's a body of information that they should have known before they got in that class, right? And the best way to see if they, and, and, and so if they don't know that information, when they get to the class, you're going to be, you're going to know immediately this student is going to struggle if they don't know this information. So a diagnostic is still helpful in that way because what you're doing is you're seeing, are they really prepared to take this level of information? And if they're not, because this is one of the classes they have to take for their major, you can see what their areas of weakness are and try to find ways to work with the academic success coaches, work with Mr. Donna and his department on creating some sort of a workshop or, or some sort of a bridge where you all can help these students that are struggling in these areas. Because what we find more often than not is that students struggle in the same areas a lot of times. You know, we'll find that students may be really, really struggling in a uh, world lit because they have to write a lot of research papers. So we see that uh, in world lit across the board, doesn't matter who the teacher is, about 40% of students are failing the world lit class, right? Well, we don't wanna wait until midterm or final exam. We wanna make sure that as soon as we see some of these issues, we're making a bridge to be able to help them so that these issues don't continue to exacerbate themselves. And so this is why assessment is so important. Does anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Let's keep going. Okay. The last type of assessment is a summative assessment. Again, this is something that you all are already doing. Summative assessment is a midterm and a final exam. It also uh, refers to what are the things called was, uh, seniors have to do like a final project. Capstone. capstone. So, capstone. yeah, capstone. Mid midterms, finals, and capstones are summative assessments. This is where you're looking at if students comprehended the overall body of information that you've been teaching throughout the course of the semester. Well, the right? diagnostic is like a pre test, is a summative or post test? Yes, sir. Okay. Precisely, precisely. And the formative is like, you know, uh, the, the tests along the way. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just periodic tests along the way, just to make sure everybody's on the same road. But and really- the formative is supposed to be some kind of standard um, relative to, if it's one subject that Dr. Ekwiki and I are both teaching, we should come together to make sure that we're touching the salient points for all students, whatever class they're in. Yes, sir. And I talked about that yesterday. Uh, I had a chance to talk about that with Professor Walker yesterday, right? So before you start teaching this class at the beginning of the, of the semester, you all should come together to make sure that number one, you have a common rubric, that students are being graded. And I think what, what sort of overwhelms some people is that they think that what we're saying when we say this is that everybody's got to teach the same way. Not at all, because that would take away from the autonomy of, of what it means to be a college professor. Nobody's trying to do that. You know, but what we're saying is, is that the standard or the student learning outcomes should be the same across the board. Because what happens if not is, is that you'll have students that come from this one teacher that are less prepared than the students that come from this other teacher. So we gotta make sure that great minds are thinking alike. And there's some sort of common rubric which aligns with the student learning outcomes for our department. Yeah, we also yeah. got to make sure that as it concerns diagnostic and summative assessments, that we're assessing the same things because we are teaching the same body of information. And again, yeah. that still leaves the autonomy to you to teach it how you want to teach it, but right. you got to make sure you're covering the basic things that must be covered. Okay. So how does Professor, let's, you mentioned Professor Walker, right? Mm-hmm. So in Professor Walker's discipline, the university does not purchase books, iBooks, eBooks in her subject matter. So how in the world can she and those who teach in her discipline effectively communicate and disseminate information if the eBooks aren't being purchased and there's no bookstore to purchase a hard copy? That's a, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one, Dr. Smith. So you're talking about assessment, mm -hmm. middle states accreditation, and so since we've gone to the ebooks, I'm giving you some history. 
in 2017, we've gone to ebooks. The number of majors in that major has diminished because students can't get what they are after. So the numbers of the major in that have dwindled. So where it used to be 40, 50 students majoring, now they probably have 10. Mm -hmm. I so, still, it's still important that Dr. Wa um, Professor Walker give a diagnostic, right? Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, you're the, our assessment expert. And so as we look at certain numbers, mm -hmm. um, and I got an email today talking about different change of majors forms are going out and people are changing majors left and right. I'm saying there's some causation for such. I know that's not the topic of this meeting, but I just want to put that on your radar relative to how can certain disciplines get ebook and other disciplines not? And we call that, you know. Right, right. Fair. Um, you know what? I, I'm going to think about that a little bit more. But with the di but with the diagnostic, this is why I keep going back to the diagnostic because what happens is is that when they first when they first get in, when these students are first arriving in this class, there's still information that Dr. Walker is assuming that they should know when they get to the class. So when she gives the, this diagnostic, she can assess who who is where they should be, who's going to need a little bit more help maybe assign them a tutor or whatever it is, whatever means they have to remediate for certain students, right? But it's better to, for her to find out in the beginning than to keep teaching and then find out in, in midterm that uh, Jaquavius has been struggling the whole time, right? But when I found out, find out in the beginning, I know how to address it. Now, as it concerns the matter of them not having books, I think that that's something that they will have to discuss departmentally to sort of uh, to get this solidified because students are going to need some sort of learning materials, especially when we're talking about of uh, students not coming to if students are not coming to class and students are not signing in virtually. At the at the very least, they got it. They have got to have a, a book in hand because again, that accountability when we talk about the accrediting body is. They're going to ask us, what have you done to address these things, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I'll share with you what I shared with a, a professor um, when I gave this same workshop last week. He said, well, I feel kind of iffy about the whole assessment process, Dr. Hall, because he said, just to be quite honest with you, the great majority of my students will fail because they don't come to class. And then the ones who are virtual, they may be asleep, but just signing in, right? And he says, so it makes me look bad to have all these failing grades. The part that I want everybody to sort of get away from is assessment is not an assessment of how well, is, is not necessarily an assessment of how well you are or are not teaching material. That's a that's, different assessment. That's right, right. That's a that's an observation you get from right. the your ups, okay? The assessment, right? The assessment is more about us having the ability to know where our students are and know how we can help them get to where we want them to be. That's what, that's what it's about, right? And we, we take that assessment that we have and we use the data to sort of fill in the blanks. And that's why it's important that we have the data in an organized fashion because that data helps us to fill in the blanks. Now, when we don't address it, it is a, it is a, a, a critique on, our, uh, on, uh, on who we are as a teacher, because you can't just keep having students fail, 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 and not even try to address it. Because uh, you know, I've been telling people and they laugh, but it's the truth. If I could tell you how to force students to come to class, I could also give you the cure for cancer, but I, I don't have it. But what I will say is that even when they're not doing what they're supposed to do, we've got to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do to still try to equip them. Because what is our response? Because nobody's going to say, well, you're right. Those kids didn't do this. What has been your response to these things? And so that is why that is why this whole assessment push is so important because it shows that Cheney is responding to retention issues. 
And even if it weren't Cheney, it would be some other school. It is how are we responding to students falling behind? Are we really preparing them for jobs after college? Because what we've been finding more and more students have been graduating unprepared. They got a degree and that it means nothing. They they still can't read, can't write, can't interview. Can't count. That's can't part count. too. It don't let the don't let the cash register be broke down. Okay. So, so assessment becomes the way that we address these matters. We at least have to make sure that we're doing what we can to meet them where they are. How they respond, that's something we got to pray about. But we've got to make sure that we meet them where they are and show some level of accountability in really, really trying to help them get to the next level. Okay, so, two things. Um, let's look at uh, retention rate from freshman to sophomore year. If it's been the same for 20 years, with maybe an uptick one year out of 20, that's going to be a telltale sign. What, what have we done to um, increase it? If let's say the average is 55 or 60 percent of freshmen um, coming back as sophomores, that's it is what it is. Same with the four year and six year graduation rate. If we graduate 25, 30 percent of our students in um, six years, or maybe 10% in four years, and that's been that way for 25 years. Um, what are we doing to, to get that number, those numbers higher? Now, we say we're bringing in a better prepared student for the past five years, but won't that bear out after the four, first four year um, that class graduates? So in 2021, wouldn't that um, demonstrate how many of those freshmen that started in 17, how many graduate in 21? To see if there's any different, any shift. And then this year, would there also be a four-year number that we can look at to see if how it compares with years gone by? You raise you raise some really um, interesting points, Dr. Smith, and some really good points, actually, right? And that is one of the reasons, as um, someone who is working on continuous improvement, I make sure that even outside of assessment, that I'm working on things that empower and equip the students outside of that. So one of the things that I think is important, I keep mentioning this bridge between the professors and the um, academic coaches, you know, and, and Mr. Ghana, you know, before when we did the academic success plan, a lot of people were, were displeased because they felt like it was an escape package for the students. But I think that, you know, I think that I, I, I felt or I empathize with the professors because I've been on that side. But in truth, something has to be done because if you have a school of 600 students, 630 students, I'm sorry, and then you find over half of those students are failing at least one, one or more classes, you've got to do something to change the trajectory of what is happening. And a lot of times when we, when we find an emergency situation like that, it, it calls for emergency uh, for an emergency response. And what, what, what I want to get us away from and what I, what I know all of us want to get away from is the emergency response. And that's where assessment comes in. That is where um, academic affairs comes in because even with them, we've been working to create some workshops that help students in, in, in many of these struggling areas. Like for instance, there's a high rate of failure among students um, in freshman English, right? So Mr. Ghana, the academic success coaches and myself have been meeting trying to figure out what sort of workshops we're going to give to address these failure rates and to help students so that they perform more effectively within the classroom. And so I think that there are means to assist I think because many of these problems did not happen in a vacuum and they didn't happen overnight, they're not going to be solved overnight. But I do think that if we are consistent and persistent in our efforts, they are going to change. Same happens with uh, math. 
lot of our um, basic math classes, Math 104, Math 111, high failure rate. Dr. Smith, what I think you're saying uh, the way I'm understanding it is that if the trend has not changed, if we say we are bringing in uh, more prepared students, quality students, and the trend of graduation has not changed, then there's something wrong that we need to take a look at, and figure out what's really going on. Yeah, uh, people, you're absolutely right, Dr. Ekwe. Okay? Um, what's happened is we've thrown away access and opportunity for people who um, were marginal at best from a standardized test standpoint. We raised the bar and said you have to have X, Y, or Z test score on a culturally and racially biased test, number one. And then we turn around, admit those students, and then they still don't perform or graduate at a higher rate. Now I understand the, the mindset and the logic of not accepting students who aren't good predictors for academic success because we don't have a, a safety net for them. We don't have, um, as a university or as a state system, we don't put much stock in remediation and PASHI. So, okay, so you get away from those students who um, need access university. But if we're bringing those students who don't necessarily have to attend an access university, open enrollment type of thing, but you're still using the racially and culturally bias by which you accept them, and then they still don't persist, now what? So Dr. Hall, let me ask. In, for those students that we send to academic coaches, do we collect data from the academic coaches as what they're doing with them, that can be included in the assessment? Yeah. Um, you can in terms of the attendance and engagement, like let's say, for instance, of course, with any workshop, any um, even with professional developments, that's why we keep a rolling tally or of attendance, right? Because the, uh, the assumption that the data is trying to make is that the more people come, then the greater the impact. And so what we can do is make sure that the uh, academic coaches are keeping attendance when they have these events and they're letting us know that the students who are consistently coming and so when you give let's say for instance when you're making your programmatic assessment you should be able to see some changes within the students based on their consistency in going to these workshops and one of the things I think that would be helpful is to dangle a carrot for some of the kids maybe that means that you'll give them some extra credit maybe it means that their consistency in going to these workshops will give them a uh, bonus points on to uh, a test that they take maybe it will excuse them from a test whatever it is the professors will figure it out but we've got to dangle some kind of carrot um, to make sure that the students become engaged in going. My question is actually trying to figure out the relevance of this academic coaching to what goes on in the classroom, the contents. If they're going down to the academic coaches, how can that relate to what's going on the subject matter in the classroom? That will I think I explained it before, Dr. Enrique, but I'll explain it again. So if you have students, and I'm just using English because English is my background. If you have a, a high failure rate in the English department, then what I'm saying is the professors will speak to the academic success coaches because they're responsible for creating workshops, um, workshops and other and tutoring plans to help the students. So the relevancy is that outside of the classroom that the academic success coaches are engaging the students in activity that improve their academic performance. So if the, these professors have reached out to the academic success coaches and said, well, our students are having problem writing analysis essays. 
quite possibly the success coaches can get together, find somebody who can teach a workshop on how to write analysis essays. That's extremely relevant because that's what the teachers have been teaching in the course. But what that does is not only reiterate, but gives them additional tools and assistance to be prepared to perform in the classroom. And so when they keep a rolling tally of attendance, it lets the teachers know who is really going to get help to take them beyond what is happening in the classroom to actually try to improve their grades and their engagement. Okay. okay. So gentlemen, I thank you for your time. Um, thank you. You're quite welcome. If you have any additional questions or concerns, and it's a lot of good information in the PowerPoint, but I don't like to present straight from the PowerPoint because it drives me nuts when you have you. I know you all have seen this. You go somewhere and people just read straight off the PowerPoint. Hmm. So, <laughs> you know, so you like to know that somebody is, is having additional information. So what I'm going to do, um, as always, is send you an ebook. And I think Dr. Dr. Smith, you've received the same ebook before because I think you came to the, the uh, workshop, which is the same workshop I gave during PD. I just mm -hmm. regave it because the turnout was low. Okay. Um, but I thank you for your time. If there's anything um, that you would like to talk to me about in greater detail, just email me and we can set up a time and a date and I'd be more than happy to work with you, talk to you, whatever you need. I have a Thank request. You, you say yeah. what, Dr. Enrique? I have a request. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Smith. The email, the email that you sent to um, Dr. Chana, which Chana, in in response to the education unit, can you forward it to me so that I can work on it right away? I for I, I forwarded it to who now? The email that you sent to Dr. Chana. Okay. You know, regarding um, in response to their credit, their assessment for education unit. Can you forward it to me because I'm the one who worked on it? I okay. can. And I'll yeah, not, as, soon as, as soon as we log off, I'll go ahead and email it to you. Great, great. Thank you so much. All right. You all have an awesome day and I'll talk to okay. you later. Okay. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Dr. Hall, one question. Yes, sir. Um, lines of inquiry. Um, what is a um, how a person who is a um, how would you say that in other words? Translate that. Ask me the question again, Dr. Smith. Lines of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Translate that. How would I translate lines of inquiry? Um, Diagnostic. Um, I might say. Other. So, uh, working groups have work to do relative to lines of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Questions. Uh, because the working group, each of them has different things that they have to kind of. Um, I don't want to say assess, but different things they have to kind of prove or see if things are being done in that area. Then they have to give documentation to support that there's work being done in that area or no work being done in that area. Read what I put in the chat, Dr. Smith. Okay. Let me go back to the Tell chat. me if that works. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh huh. And Dr. Uh -huh. Smith, make sure that you watch uh, the debate next week. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Okay. Most definitely. I um turned Miss Cobb and Mr. Word on to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, all right. Well, you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you later. Okay. Thank you so much for your help. You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right. Goodbye.